I now want to introduce Mike Riddle. Um, Mike Riddle has been in the creation versus evolution controversy for more than uh, 30 years, more than 35 years at this point in time. And uh, he does a great job at doing that. R over the last few years, he formed this company called creationtraining.org. And as you can see by his bio, uh, he spent a lot of time with um, major corporations running their training programs. And so he's uh, applying that to training in the creation versus evolution field. And uh, we've known Mike for a long time. Uh, he's uh, moved to Boise, Idaho, so he's not too far away. And we've invited him to speak on this topic that you see there, critical thinking skills that disarm evolutionists. Mike? Let's walk in. Well, thank you. Might be the only time I get any clapping. <laughs> I'll take it any time I can get it. Well, thank you very much for coming out this evening. Isn't it still a wonderful time to be a Bible-believing Christian? Amen. It's getting harder, though, isn't it? That's a great opportunity to go out and witness to the world. It's not a time to shy back. It's a time to go forward. That's what we do in the United States Marine Corps. We take hills. There's a lot of hills out there. Let's go get them. Okay. I tend to talk military. So critical thinking skills that disarm evolutionists. Uh, I, I like to get started right into it because I've got a lot to say. Sometimes you'll hear me talking out both sides of my mouth just to get it out there. I watch politicians. <laughs> so, evolution. Here's a biology textbook. This is what they're teaching our youth. Today, nearly all biologists acknowledge that evolution is a fact. Here's the National Academy of Sciences. Is evolution a theory or fact? It is both. Tonight we're going to take on that Goliath. We're going to show both those statements are absolutely false and cannot be supported scientifically. And we're going to do it not even having used much science. So, challenging Goliath today. Common evolutionary tactics. If you're in a battle, you need to understand what you're up against. You need to understand the strategy and the tactics of your opponent or you're not going to be in very good shape. So here's where we get a lot of bluffing. I hear a lot of teachers doing a lot of bluffing in the classrooms. We all know. Well, have they talked to everybody? Probably not, because that's about six billion people. Over millions of years, that's the biggest bluff I hear. Over millions of years, all that means is we don't have the evidence, just believe us. How many here has observed millions of years? I'm probably closer than most of you, but don't laugh so hard there. Grades. Only evolutionist answers are allowed or you're going to fail this course. Opposition is disallowed. That's a very good sign of a cult when they don't allow any opposition. Intimidation techniques they use against their youth. Discredit the Bible and anybody that believes in creation. Discredit anyone who does not believe in evolution. They'll even call you names. How many here believe in a flat earth? Yes. Yeah. So. That's what we're called. You're just an ignorant flat earther who doesn't believe in science. How many of you like that? That's some of the nice things I've been called. <laughs> or establish the illusion of authority and facts. That's what our students are up against. And if we can't answer some of these things as we go through here, how can we expect our students to survive? Some of you already know the rate of our students that are leaving the church today. Over four independent studies have shown about 70% of our youth are leaving the church because they can't trust the Bible anymore. And incidentally, that's happening in our own Christian universities today, teaching secular humanism. So the critical thinking method. Normally when we're approached by an evolutionist, they might give some evidence, and we start focusing on the evidence. But not tonight. I'm going to show you something else. Let's stop focusing on the evidence and focus on the words they use. Analyze the words they use, holding accountable for the words that they used. In other words, let's stop being on the defense and let's go on the offense. Stop answering their questions and let's analyze their statements and turn the whole situation around on them. That's part of the critical thinking method. So I'm going to start by giving you three critical thinking questions. You're not allowed to leave here tonight unless you know all three of them. If you don't know one, you can substitute 20 push-ups for the ones you don't know. Yes, thank you. Push-ups are my cure for everything. And there's no wiggling the body on these things. If you've got a sore arm, that's not an excuse because God gave you another arm. Use it. Okay, three critical thinking methods. 
there are questions. When I teach high schoolers, this is one of my favorite talks, because this is what will give them something to walk away with. So question number one, when you're approached by evolutionists and they give you a challenge, ask them this question, how do you know it's true? That forces them to give their source of their knowledge, which is a lot of time the internet. Not real reliable. How do you know it's true? Has it ever been observed? That's another pretty good one. Has it ever been observed? How many observed millions of years again? Nobody in here. How many observed the Big Bang? Nobody. How many observed the origin of life? Nobody. How many observed one creature evolve into another creature? Nobody. What have they observed? Horses produce horses. Dogs produce dogs. Cats produce cats. That's what we observe. And are you making any assumptions? Hey, can anybody give me all three of these? Anybody want to give me all three of these? Go ahead. Anybody want to try all three of these? Okay. Probably caught some of you already having assumptions out there. How many assumed you couldn't look up here? <laughs> I never said you couldn't do that. Okay. So how do you know it's true? Has it ever been observed? Are you making any assumptions? This will stop people in their tracks and have them to start thinking on an area they don't, they're not allowed to think. They're just giving rote information what they heard. So how do you know it's true? Has it ever been observed? Are you making any assumptions? Okay. Let's apply this. Life originated in a pool of chemicals about 3.7 billion years ago. Okay. How do you know it's true? How do they know that's true? Well, most scientists believe that. That's not a very good answer, is it? Most scientists have been wrong in the past. Has it ever been observed? Anybody here 3.7 million years old? No, so it's not been observed. Our best scientists in the world can't even make one single biological protein. Not even a small one they can't make. So we don't even have to talk about DNA, RNA, organelles, ribosomes. How many got excited when I said those words? <laughs> you know who the crazies are now. Good, good, thank you. Yes. And are they making any assumptions here? Well, they have to make assumptions if it's never been observed. And if we can't do it in the laboratory, it has to be assumptions. So what is their answer to this? Their ultimate answer has to be faith. They're asking us to believe this by faith because they have no observable evidence to support that claim. Here's another one from a textbook. Scientists do know that about 200 to 300 million years after Earth cooled enough to carry liquid water, cells similar to modern bacteria were common. So those words, do know, that's right out of a textbook. How do they know that's true? They weren't there. Has it ever been observed? No. Are they making any assumptions? See, that breaks the whole argument down. We don't have to get into all the scientific discussion. I don't like to get into scientific discussions. I'll do it if I need to. If I need to break down a few strongholds, I'll go with there with the science. But my goal is to get down to the real issues. Why are they believing what they believe? What is their worldview? Is their worldview based on reality or not? That's where I want to get the issues to. Critical thinking questions. Okay, here are the three. How do you know it's true? Is it ever been observed? Make any assumptions. How many know all three of those now? Okay. Remember, my opening comments. You don't leave here tonight until you know all three. See, I have the greatest teaching method of all time. I use the greatest teaching method of all time. It is called fear and intimidation. It just causes people to remember things. They didn't think they could. Works real well. Fear and intimidation. I used to use it on all the Microsoft engineers when I trained them. If they were late from a break, the door closed and was locked. The only way they can get in, 20 push-ups. <laughs> Those young folks needed it. Yeah, I spent my years teaching there. Okay, now, we had those three questions. Now let's go to what I call a power question. A power question. Show me any observational evidence for evolution that does not require me to use faith. There's two key words in here. Two key words. Observational and faith. Show me any observational evidence for evolution that does not require me to use faith. You know, they can. But they can bluff their way. This is where they get away with the bluff. How about bacteria resistant to our antibiotics? We put all these antibiotics in there. These bacteria are not dying out. They're turning around just smiling at us. They're not dying out. Why? Well, that's evolution it's happening right before our eyes. No, it is not. What it is, 
some protein functionality in there. The protein that carries the antibiotics in there, there's a mutation that occurs, and the antibiotic never gets carried into the system. See, it's a loss, not a gain. It's the opposite direction of evolutionism. See, they get away with these bluffs because their students know, know this information. This is why it's important for us to know it as parents, because who's the number one teacher in a child's life? It's the parents. So we need to arm you as parents on this so you can train your children. Let's try one. Life must be on other planets. It's arrogant to believe we're the only life in the universe. I did a talk on this in a physics class today at Grace Academy on aliens, UFOs, and the Bible. We had a great time. I showed them what sports the aliens played in also. We had sports cards there. So it's pretty good proof. Okay, how about that statement? Is it really arrogant? Well, let's apply the power question. Show me any observational evidence for life anywhere else in this universe that does not require me to use faith. Has anybody ever done that? We have places here on this planet we don't even have intelligent life. And you, you could probably name the cities. Yes. No, they can't do that. You see, rather than trying to answer all the questions, let's turn it around by asking the questions. Didn't somebody in the Bible do that once? Yes, his name was Jesus. Yes, he did that exact tactic. See, I have not invented one single thing new here. I just like to borrow from the Bible, because who's the greatest teacher of all time? Jesus. Let's model how he taught. Here's another one. Over millions of years, mutations added new genetic information allowing for all the diversity of life we see today. Anybody see any creatures like those up there? Look carefully at that polar bear. It's been new and improved. <laughs> yes. That's what computer people do when they don't have anything better to do. <laughs> okay. How do you answer this one? Show me any observational evidence where that vast amount of information in our DNA came from that does not require me to use faith. So that's where we take it. Show me any observational evidence for where that vast amount of information in our DNA came from that does not require me to use faith. The only answer they can give, the only answer they can give is, well, Mike, over millions of years and mutations. Wait, stop right there. Has anybody observed millions of years? No, it's the big bluff. What they're saying is, just trust me. Time will do all things. Time will work the miracles. Time does not work miracles. You need a miracle maker to do that. You see, they cannot get by these type of questions. All they can do is bluff their way through. So we have to know enough to catch some of these bluffs too, don't we? Now, you ready for a quiz? That's what teachers do. How many teachers do I have here? Good, good. Thank you for being a teacher. Thank you. All your parents are teachers. Did you know that? <laughs> yes, all parents are teachers. So I'm going to give you a pop quiz. Uh, the only passing grade is 100%. When I teach, I don't tolerate failure. My goal when I teach, no matter what kind of course it is, whether it's mathematics, Bible, or anything, computers, is 80% of the people in my class will get A's. I don't want anything less. And I succeed at that. And my classes are some of the most intense classes you'll ever be in in your life. That's the only way I teach. They're intense. But when you're done, you know the subject. And I have a very high success rate for this. So pop quiz. Show me any. Now let's do this section over here. Now this section will be responsible for this one. You need to fill in the blanks on this one. If we do not get an answer from them or a wrong answer, what should they have to do? 20 push-ups, yes, the whole group, okay? Fill in the blanks, that group, don't help them. Observational and faith. Isn't that sad they got them? Now they don't have to do push-ups. Okay, very good. Thank you, group, thank you. Okay, this group, give me the first two. I know it's true. Okay, the final group over there can do the third one. Okay, very good. Who said that one? Okay, they should take you out to dinner because you just saved them from doing push-ups. Okay, thank you. See, see, I know how to play this game real well here. Notice what I'm doing here for those of you who like to teach. The repetition I do. 
over and over and over again. And I'll talk about this tomorrow in the class. What I do when I'm doing high schoolers, I assign somebody to be number one, number two, and number three. When I say number one, they will always say, how do you know it's true? When I say number two, they'll say, has it ever been observed? When I say number three, they'll say, are you making any assumptions? So in the middle of my hour talk, I'll just go number one, number two, and number three. By the time we get done, they've heard this 20 times. It's disguised form of repetition. They don't see it that way. They just see it as fear. <laughs> yes. Okay, words have meaning. How to read between the lines, how to read a technical article, not know anything about the science, and take it apart. How's that sound? I call them fuzzy words and magic words. How many learned about these in English class? Nobody? Well, you really missed out. Fuzzy words and magic words. You'll find them everywhere. Find a lot of these words in textbooks. So what are fuzzy words? The words like, we believe, we think, must have, could have, my opinion is, we guess over millions of years. Why are those so fuzzy? When words like that are used, what they're really saying is we don't have the observable evidence. It's just we think. Fuzzy words. Let's apply this. Here's a life science textbook, grade 7. Paleontologists think that Archaeopteryx and today's birds are descended from some kind of reptile, possibly from a dinosaur. First fuzzy word is think that. They don't really know, they just think that. Some kind of, in other words, they're not sure what kind of reptile. Then the very big scientific term is possibly. What do they know here? Not much at all. Look for these words. You'll find them in newspapers all the time, too. And you'll see a lot in politicians. That's right. Here's USA Today. There are likely tens of billions of Earth-like planets in our Milky Way galaxy. In fact, the nearest Earth-like planet may be only 12 light years away. And with a universe of hundreds of billions of galaxies, our entire universe must contain billions of Earth-like planets. There are likely. That's not very positive there, is it? I like this one. In fact, maybe. <laughs> Did they just contradict themselves there? <laughs> must contain. Plants, that's a PowerPoint error. <laughs> Certainly can't be you. Blame that one on Microsoft. Yes. I don't know if that's the original article. I think I just copied it from the original article. <laughs> Fuzzy words. Look for those. Here's the Perot Museum. Fairly new museum. Totally dedicated to evolutionism. Dallas, Texas. Wife and I had to visit this, and it was just full of good ammunition. Experiments with model protocells show that how early life could have begun evolving. Protocells must grow quickly and reproduce most often when they contain genetic material that can copy itself. These protocells outcompete others. What is a protocell? You ever think about what is a protocell? It's something on its way to becoming a cell. Notice they said model. What does that mean? They don't have any of these things. They never existed. We find things that are not cells, and we find things that are cells. But no one has ever found a protocell. So challenge their statements. Could have begun evolving. They're not sure whether these things evolved or not, but they could have. Must grow quickly. How do they know that if it's never been seen? How do you know that's true? Has it ever been observed? Are you making any assumptions? These protocells outcompete others. Sounds like a track meet. <laughs> How do they know that? Were they there? That's the three critical thinking questions all the way through here in every one of these statements. How do you know it's true? Has it ever been observed? Are you making any assumptions? Be careful of these statements that have lots of technical terms in them. Joseph Silk, he's an astronomer, very good astronomer. He's an evolutionist, though. Wrote a book called The Big Bang, read through his book. And here's the statement he's going to make about how galaxies form. And let me read through this and see if anybody understands what this man just said. You ready? Imagine that infinitesimal fluctuations and density were present in the early universe. The expansion of the universe must have exerted a stabilizing influence on such irregularities. The expanding universe has the effect of greatly impeding what otherwise might have been catastrophic forces. Nevertheless, the process of growth of fluctuations went on for a very long time. How many understood that one? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I'm not sure, but where's the first fuzzy word? Imagine. What does that tell you about the whole paragraph now? <laughs> really don't have to read much further because it's all imagination. See what critical thinking does? Fuzzy words magic. Must have. He's not sure, but he's just saying they must have. Why must they have? Might have been. He's not sure there. Went on for a very long time. You know, no one's ever observed a galaxy form. There's no known scientific process for how galaxies will form, nor are there processes for how stars form. We know based on good physics, stars will not form on their own through naturalistic processes. So the whole thing sounds pretty good, but it's nothing but fuzzy words. Let's go to magic words now. Not like abracadabra, but appeared, emerged, rose, gave rise to, was on the way to becoming, burst on the seed, evolved itself, was making a transition to. These are words to describe how something happened without telling us how it could have happened or the process how it happened. So let's look at a couple here. Evo devil, that's evolutionary development, proposes that genes involved cobbling together flesh and bone during early growth were repurposed to develop new structures throughout evolution's history by combining their functions in new ways. Magic word is repurposed. Okay, we've had a quiz. Can I give you a homework assignment now? How many wish you hadn't come? Let me give you a homework assignment. What I want you to do tonight is go home and repurpose yourself into another creature. How do you do that? What is the method for all of this? It was nowhere described in this article. Now, I know what they would say. Over millions of years with mutations and the process of natural selection. No, natural selection doesn't do this. Neither do mutations. That is well, well thought out and well established now that mutations have never been observed to add new genetic information. Never. They're dead right there. In order to survive, living things have evolved sensory systems that are adapted to their specific environments and needs. In addition to seeing, hearing, touching, and smelling, organisms have evolved a fascinating range of ways to sense their environment. Some create pictures with sound. Others detect heat or navigate through electricity. This is from the Pro Museum again. There was a lot of good ammunition there. Evolved sensory systems. That's a very highly complex system, isn't it? Sensory systems. You know, our ear is pretty complex, isn't it? You know, the ear has three parts. Anybody know the three parts? No. Outer, middle, and inner. <laughs> Let's keep this simple. <laughs> Now, the outer part captures what? The sound waves, all these sine waves that are coming like this that I'm giving out here. What does the middle part do? That's your eardrum, right? Your smallest bones are in your body there. But it's the inner part that does something amazing. It converts the sound waves into electrical pulses and sends them to the brain. We can't do things like that. Whoever made that ear has to be smarter than anybody's ever lived on this planet. So we're talking very complex systems. And they're just saying evolve sensory systems as if it just happens all the time. Let's challenge them on this. I'd like to see the observable evidence for how that happened. And if you can't produce that evidence, then you're asking me to accept this by faith. No, the inner part of the ear does that. The, sound, the eardrum just amplifies. A little bit, yes. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't send anything to the brain to interpret. That's a big difference. We just send them through the airwaves. <laughs> okay. Yes. How about adapt it? What does that mean? They adapt it. You know, adapt, being adapt to your environment has nothing to do with evolutionism. What allows us to adjust to cold or hot or high altitude is the information that's already pre-programmed in our DNA. That's what allows us. How many like, how many don't like really hot weather here? Oh, that's the only kind of weather there is. I like that. So we're going to send you to Death Valley for the summertime. <laughs> Question is, will you survive? Yes, you will. You may not like it, but you're going to survive. But after a while, 90 degrees, you're going to be wearing a jacket, aren't you, with 90 degrees? Because it gets up to 120 there in the summer. Yeah, you probably put a jacket on, it'll be 90 degrees, 80 degrees, seem cold. 
What allows you to adjust? Well, let's try another one. Pikes Peak, what state? Colorado. How high? 14,110 feet. 300 feet lower than Mount Rainier, so you've got a higher mountain. Just remember that here. 14,110 feet high. We're going to take you up to Pikes Peak, drop you off there, and as soon as you get dropped off there, you're going to run around as fast as you can. What's going to happen? Some of you might faint. Some of you might have a heart attack. But you're going to be out of breath. You're going to get very sick because of the high altitude, the very thin air up there. But after staying up there a couple months, you run around, it seems like normal. What happened? Right, you adjust it. What allowed you to adjust? Did the mountain do anything to you? No, the mountain has no intelligence. It can't decide anything. What allowed you to adjust? The information that's already pre-programmed into your DNA. That's what allows you to adjust within limits. You can adjust to different situations within limits. How many like to swim here? Okay, we're going to send you down to the deep end of the pool with no equipment. Can you spend an hour down there? Well, you will, but you're going to float to the top after you're dead. <laughs> you see, we can adjust to different situations within limits. God's pre-programmed that into us. But nowhere can we become a new kind of creature. Can't happen. Because mutations do not add new genetic information. So let's look at some more fuzziness here. Evolved a fascinating range of ways to sense their environment. How did that happen? These are fascinating ways to do this. These are not simple processes. These are very complex. We need answers for how this could happen, and we need to demand observable evidence. And some create pictures with sound. That's pretty complicated. How many here can make sound waves and create pictures out of it? And others detected heat or navigate with electricity. Wow. Every one of these is a very complex mechanism. I'd like to know how it really happened. You see, this is what they're getting away with with our students. Making these claims, and nobody is allowed, and that's usually the case, especially in universities, allowed to ask questions. Around 230 million years ago, during the Triassic period, a new type of reptile emerged on the scenes. Dinosaurs would rule the land for 160 million years. A new type of reptile emerged. Well, we know what they're talking about, the dinosaurs. But how did they emerge? I would like to see all the thousands of transitions that led up to the dinosaurs. I've been in museums all over this world. You know what I see in museums? Dinosaur bones. Look at all these dinosaur books. What do you see? Pictures of dinosaurs. What am I not seeing? All the transitions leading up to them. That cannot be found in any museums in this world. So this is a claim without the evidence. I'd like to know how they emerged. So now, we've had critical thinking questions, a power question, fuzzy words, magic words. I'd like to show you something about the fossil record. We're going to make the fossil record really easy. Really, how, like, how many like easy things? I like easy things, thin books with lots of color pictures. I like those. The fossil record proves evolution is true. This is what our youth are being taught. Is that a true statement? Well, let's look at the fossil record. This is what we're going to do. Ooh, I see another quiz in there. We're going to look at just these things. Notice we're not going to look at any individual fossils that much. We don't have to get into the fossils that much. So let's start with critical thinking. Okay, we had our three critical thinking questions. We had our power question. Now, here's a question. Every one of our students should be thinking about when they see a picture of a fossil in a textbook. How much of that fossil was actually found and how much was drawn in by the artist? Let's get them to at least think about that. They can ask it in class, but they should at least start thinking about that. How much of that fossil was actually found and how much was drawn in by the artist? Yep, in range, by even more than that. So here's an example. This is from a biology textbook. For instance, modern whales are the descendants of four-legged land animals. In other words, according to evolution, some land animal, like a wolf, decided to go back into the ocean and decided to become a whale. That's what they're teaching our students. And I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to prove to you right now this is what really happened. There's the evidence right out of the textbook. How much of that, those fossils were actually found and how much were drawn in by the artist? None of those fossils were found like that. 
Very few bones were found on any of these creatures. This is not science. This is deception. Now, here's a book called Science. Now, I don't think they deserve the name. But in there, they talk about a creature called Pachycetus. And they've used this in schools for a long time. This was the candidate for becoming a whale. This land mammal was halfway be between a mammal and becoming a full whale. Now, are whales mammals? Yes, they are. I put the words artist reconstruction in there. Now, how much of that fossil that they show here was actually found? How much was drawn in by the artist? Can I show you how much of the fossil they originally found to draw this? Just the shaded portions of the skull. That's not even 90%, is it? None of the rest of the body was found originally, just part of the skull, and they drew these pictures. They later found the rest of the fossil that went with this. This is what it looked like. Now, the picture beside it with all the fur, we don't know what the fur was, how much hair it had, but that does not look like an aquatic creature at all. Complete misconception by the evolutionists there. And they've done this numerous times. Anybody remember this guy? Anybody have one like that in your uh, lineage? Piltdown man. Actually, it wouldn't be so bad. They're just human beings. Piltdown man. Here was the latest in the newspaper back then. Darwin theory is proved true, found in the early 1900s. Notice, Darwin is proved, proven true because we found Piltdown men. What did they actually find? Only the shaded portions. A little bit of the jawbone, a little bit of the skull. It's all that was found. And they dated this at 500,000 years old. Look at the, the times after over 40 years as being taught as a fact in our public school systems, somebody took a close analysis of the original bones, and then the newspaper changed their story. Piltdown man forgery, jaw and tooth of modern ape, elaborate hoax. Somebody had combined some bones of an ape and a human being, combined them together, chemically stained them to make them appear old, and that fooled the scientists for over 40 years. Are you ready for your quiz now? Okay, fossil record quiz. You look like you're ready. You know the rules, 100% or you fail. There'll be 10 questions. Do not fail this. On the left there is a picture of a fossil turtle. On the right is a living turtle. What does a fossil turtle look like? Did that surprise anybody? That turtles have always been turtles. There are some fossil imprints. What do they look like? Or spiders have always looked like spiders. According to evolutionists now, the, the left side there is a fossil of a 400 million year old starfish. What does it look like? This is a very dumb creature. 400 million years in the ocean, never grew legs to walk out of it. According to evolutionists, there's a fossil of a 50 million year old, what is that? Bat, what does it look like, that fossil? Looks like a modern bat today, no change. Fossil crabs, what do they look like? Okay. Here's your trick question. What does a fossil shrimp look like? It's a trick question, be careful. Still looks like a cocktail, doesn't it? <laughs> fossil dragonflies, no change there. Fossil horseshoe crabs, no change. Seahorses, no change. Frogs always look like frogs. How many got all 10 of those correct? How many are just putting your hand up out of fear? <laughs> okay. I didn't see any evolution there. I didn't see any. Here's some more. No change in 100 million years in alligators. No change. Coelacanth fish was supposed to be extinct for almost 70 million years. No change in over 100 million years in these coelacanths. We found them still living in the early 1900s. See, they were telling our students that the coelacanth fish being extinct for 70 million years was growing legs, becoming an amphibian. In the early 1900s, they found the coelacanth still living. Guess what they look like? Fish. No legs at all. Again, a misinterpretation. The tuatara lizard, this is the ones they like to use in dinosaur movies. No change in 200 million years. Now, the millions of years are according to evolutionist timing, but they haven't changed. 
Scorpions, no change in 360 million years. Jellyfish, no change in 500 million years. Where's the evolution? Anybody have one of these at home? <laughs> now, if evolution really happened, we should find some really amazing transitions, shouldn't we? How many have found the land shark? Anybody found one of those? How many have found the gator bird? We haven't even found those in Florida yet. How many have found the tiger bunny? Or how about the rhino melon? Watch out what you pick in the garden. Or how about the bird dog? Sounds like a song, doesn't it? How many of us old people here remember who sang that song? Yes. Who, th who was thinking the Everly Brothers? Yes. That's for us old people. How about the Sparrow Boxer? <laughs> Have one of those on your finger. Or a cat cow, farm animal and pet all in one. Now this one, now don't laugh at this one. This, is a, this one really does exist. We have found this. They exist in many churches. How about the swimming pool? Or how about a face only a mother could love? Now we're having a little fun here, but we should find some real transitions that we don't have to hire artists for, for to support evolutionism. And we're not finding that. So we can't find the real transitions. Number two in the fossil record is the Cambrian explosion. When I have to talk about fossils, this is the place I'm going to go to first, right here, Cambrian explosion. What's so important? Well, we have all, this geologic, all these geologic layers there. But let's go down to the bottom layers. They're called the Cambrian and Precambrian layers. If you can't remember the name, just say bottom layers. Why is that so important? Because what we find down there are fossils of single cells and fossils of very complex creatures like jellyfish, seashells, trilobites, and even some fish. What we're not finding are any transitions leading up to these complex creatures. Zero transitions leading from a single cell to all these complex body shapes. Almost every body shape or type shows up in the Cambrian era with no transitions leading up to it. It's as if, and this might surprise you, it's as if every one of these creatures was created after its kind, because that's exactly what the fossil record shows. No transitions. This is a killer to the evolutionist. When somebody brings up the fossil record, you just bring this one up. In order to have all these fossils up here, you have to have a start, a foundation. Could you show me all the transitions in the Precambrian and Cambrian layers? Jonathan Sarfati, PhD in physical chemistry. The Cambrian explosion is a mystery for evolutionists. John Ashton, PhD, professor of biomedical sciences. The sudden appearance of fully formed species in the fossil record without apparent evolutionary ancestors and mutant intermediate species is a major problem for the evolutionist. Here's a couple of gentlemen in the book, The Invertebrate, a new synthesis, a textbook. Most of the animal phyla, body shapes, that are represented in the fossil record first appear fully formed in the Cambrian. The fossil record is therefore of no help with respect to the origin and early diversification of the various animal phyla. Why won't they teach our students this information? Because it's not the Christians who are afraid of science, it is the evolutionist. A third part, fossil graveyards. Fossil gra this is where we find thousands, sometimes thousands of creatures all buried and mangled together. Now, how do you become a fossil? You must be buried rapidly by the sediments to keep the oxygen out and the scavengers away. Buried rapidly. So I want to talk about fossil graveyards. Here's one in Nebraska. A fossil graveyard of about 9,000 creatures were found. What kind of creatures? Look at all these creatures. They don't all live in the same zones, do they? How did they all get there piled up together? And incidentally, they're all buried in sediments laid down by water. 
what does that sound like? It sounds like a flood. These things don't happen over long, slow processes. They must be buried rapidly. Here's another one, Wyoming. 483 dinosaurs buried over a seven-mile-long area. That is a large flood. Incidentally, it's sediments laid down by water. Every one of these I'm showing is sediments laid down by water. That's where we find most of our fossils in sediments laid down by water. And you know what? When you have those kind of sediments, sedimentary rock, radiometric dating can't date those rocks. Radiometric dating can only be used to date rocks that were once molten hot, then cooled. And that's not sedimentary rocks where we find most fossils. So how do we date these things? Well, if you read the most current literature, geology literature, by the U.S. Geologic Survey, they do not use the layers to determine time. They use the fossils in there to determine time. And guess what we know about the fossils? We're finding amazing things in there. Dinosaurs. Let's take dinosaurs, for example. You know what we find in dinosaurs today? Carbon-14. Well, that's nice, Mike. What's so big about that? Well, carbon-14, you all have carbon-14 in you. We eat it, we breathe it, we get it in us. But when something dies, you don't eat or breathe anymore, do you? Is that true? Just make sure. But that means you're not taking carbon-14 in you because that's how you get it in you, eat and breathe it. But once you're dead, you no longer eat and breathe, but the carbon-14 that was in you continues to decay away. And after about 80 to 100,000 years, all the datable carbon-14 is gone. Should be no carbon-14 in any dinosaur bones in this planet, according to evolutionists. But guess what we're finding in all the dinosaur bones? Carbon-14, what does that mean? They're going to be thousands of years old. If we're using those as an index fossil, that has to be wrong, doesn't it? We're finding carbon-14 in lots of creatures now. In other words, these index fossils are not very good for the evolutionist. So the whole idea of geologic dating is wrong. We have no way of dating these things other than there must have been a flood about four and a half thousand years ago that buried all these things. Uh, we're talking maybe a couple hundred thousand years. After 100,000 years, there's still some tiny residue left, but it's so little we can't date it. Even the best equipment in the world can't do it. Best equipment in the world can only date back about 60 to 70, 80,000 years at best. So I always say dateable carbon-14 in there. And we're finding extensive amount of carbon-14 in the dinosaurs, which is a killer to the evolution. If we find it in coal, diamonds, oil, which is supposed to be millions to billions of years old, can't be. Carbon-14 was never a reliable dating method. It's not that the dating uh, is re reliable or unreliable. The fact is we're finding carbon-14 in there. See, carbon-14 was based on an assumption. The assumption was proven false and shown false by the inventor of carbon-14, Dr. Willard Libby. He ignored that the assumption was false and got a Nobel Prize for it. Yes. Well, let's go on to this. Utah, over 12,000 bones belonging to at least 74 individual dinosaurs were buried there. How did, that, how did that happen? Here's Alaska and Siberia. Look at all these different kinds of creatures that are buried there. Remember, in order to be fossil, you have to be buried rapidly. And these are all sediments laid down by water. Dinosaur National Monument, Utah. 1,600 individual bones for 11 different species of dinosaurs. Grand Canyon, a mile above sea level. Billions of nautilide. Those are those long cigar-shaped type fossils, billions of them in a layer all the way, almost all the way through the Grand Canyon there. Now, wait a minute. Grand Canyon is a mile above sea level. And guess with these fossils, these seashells, we did not find any legs. They could not walk up there. So how did they get up there? How about a world by flood? France, hundreds of thousands of marine creatures buried with other kinds of creatures. We find these fossil graveyards all over the world. Wyoming, alligators, fish, birds, turtles. In Chile, they recently found a whale fossil graveyard. 20 of these whales were completely intact. That means very rapid burial. What did the evolution say about this? Well, here's their only explanation. There must have been many, many small catastrophic floods. But did anybody observe a lot of those? So the big challenge we had, does the fossil record prove evolution true or not? That's a false statement. 
It cannot be supported scientifically. Let's do the last part, red flag words. How many remember that uh, cult, uh, I call it like a cult series there. Anybody remember the name of that one? Lost in Space with Dr. Smith. He'd have survived about a half hour on my ship. He'd have been thrown overboard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Danger, danger. Red flag words. Okay, here's an example of red flag words. I'm going to go through some of these. All, everybody, no real scientist. I believe, I think, truth, fundamentalist, intolerant. Well, I call these red flag words because when somebody uses them in a statement or sentence, you should have a red flag go up, an alarm says, wait a minute, I need to analyze what they just said before I give an answer. The first three there express an absolute. All, everybody, no real scientists. They express an absolute. The next one express a personal opinion or idea. And the last bunch are just a reference to being closed-minded. In other words, it's that logical fallacy ad hominem. Let's take a couple of these. People should decide for themselves what is right and what is wrong. This is what they're teaching in the public school system today. People should decide for themselves. How do we answer that? Well, if you're saying that people should decide for themselves what is right and wrong, I just decided your statement is wrong. <laughs> it's very simple, isn't it? This is an example of moral relativism, which our kids are getting beat to death on today. It is a self-defeating philosophy. No one has the whole truth. That's a series of logical fallacies there. No one has the whole truth. They're actually setting themselves up as the authority. That's a personal opinion to authority, logical fallacy there. If no one has the whole truth, then why should I believe what you just said? It's the same kind of thing, isn't it? A better way to say that is no one has the whole truth, including me. All real scientists believe in evolution. That's also the logical fallacy of appeal to authority because they're setting themselves up as the authority. Also, what else is it? All real scientists. Okay, what is a real scientist? Who's to tell me what a real scientist is? Well, in their worldview, it's people that agree with them. And I know how to answer that one, too. But have they talked to all real scientists then? No, they haven't. So this one's full of fallacies. Why are Christians so intolerant of other views? Well, why are you so intolerant of my alleged intolerance? See, we need to know how to answer these. No, that won't work. <laughs> yep, that would, that would suffice. I believe women should have the right to choose abortion. I agree. Women should have the right to choose who they want to marry, where they want to live, what job they want. But I don't believe they should have the right to terminate another human being's life to choose. Is that how we turn that around? So final analysis. We've had three critical thinking questions. Can anybody in this group give me one of them? Has it ever been observed? Okay. How about this group? Give me another one. How you know it's true? And are you making any assumptions? You came through again for him. Good for you. <laughs> what were the two key words in the power question? Observational and faith. Very good. We had fuzzy words and magic words. We had a quiz. We didn't find any change in these creatures. We had the Cameron explosion, no transitions can we find. Fossil graveyards, they shouldn't be there according to evolutionists, but they are. And then we had red flag words. We covered quite a bit in this, this time here. So two questions. Who's going to train the next generation? And what would they be trained to believe? Again, most of you heard about 70% of our Christian youth are leaving the church before they finish school now. They can't handle it. They're not trained. Why are they leaving? Because they lack trust in the Bible. I'm talking about our Christian youth been in Sunday school for 12 years. Don't trust the Bible. Something's wrong with Christian education today. We're not teaching. We're not teaching the foundation for the gospel because the gospel starts in the first three chapters of Genesis. Why did Jesus have to suffer and die on that cross? The first three chapters of Genesis. If you believe in billions of years, then you just destroyed the whole foundation for the gospel. 
That's the problem we have. Or are we going to train them on a biblical worldview? We need to make sure all our Christian schools are on board with this, because most of them are not. Uh, we have a newsletter that we come out with about once, once, sometimes twice a month. You can sign up for this. It's very easy to get rid of. It just takes one key. It's only electronic. What are we trying to do about this? At Creation Training Initiative, what we do, our mission is to train others how to speak and teach on creation and apologetics. That's our mission. That's what we do. We have a five-day training class. We only offer this once a year. Not like any other Christian course you've ever been to. We only do this once a year. We have some brochures back there about this. This year we're going to hold it in August 14th through the 19th. Where we're going to hold it in the Glorieta Conference Center in New Mexico. Wonderful conference center. We only take 60 students from around the country. That's all we take. It's for college age and above. We have had a couple high school students to come with their parents. That's fine because these students were well prepared already. This is not your normal class. You'll come to this class, and you'll spend 10 hours a day in the classroom, and you will like it. <laughs> That's right. Uh, you won't just have to listen to presentations. You have to demonstrate you can do this. You have to do two five-minute presentations or less, three to five-minute presentations on a topic. I have a stopwatch there. If you're one second over, I take a point off. That leaves most pastors out right there. <laughs> then you do a three-minute defense presentation. You're not sure what the topic's going to be, but it's something we've covered. We'll give you the challenge. You have three minutes or less to give us an organized response. And then you do a written final exam, closed book, closed note. This is going to be our fourth year doing this. Our success rate is 100%. My classes are not easy, but I do not tolerate failure. We work as a team for nothing less than success. We've had people come to this class who have never spoken in front of anybody in their life, and they're scared to death. I have a whole chapter in there I teach on communication skills, and these people succeed. We work as a team because that's what we want. We should never tolerate failure in Christian education. That's what the world does. We need to be the best education in the world, not like the world. So that's my style of education. There's three of us that co-teach this course together. So you don't have to put it with me the whole time. The other two are nice. <laughs> Both of them are pastors. One is an excellent debater. He's written books on apologetics. The other one is a New Testament Greek scholar and a wonderful teacher also. So it's a class that if you're interested in doing this, think about that. Pick up a brochure back there. Think about coming. The price is $570. That sounds like a lot. However, what you get there, you get private rooms like hotel rooms. Private room, private bath. You don't have to share a room. You get three good meals a day, not hot dogs and pizza. Three good healthy meals a day. The room alone is about $450 to $500. That's how much the room cost us. And you're only paying 570 and you get three meals a day. You get a 300-page manual. We supplement this. We have to raise nearly $30,000 a year for our ministry to put this course on because what the students pay doesn't even come close to what we have to pay for this. So if you're interested in coming, when you're done, you're ready to go back and start teaching this or defending the faith with much greater confidence attending this course. This is what we do at Creation, Creation Training Initiative. We have one-day classes. We've done them here before, so one-day classes. We got the one tomorrow. Uh, we are working on something new, just to kind of throw it out. We haven't advertised this at all. We won't for a while. We're doing a feasibility study to see if we can do it. It's called an apologetics certification program. It will be better than any Christian university in this country because I know what they do in their apologetics. We're going to outdo all the Christian universities. We're looking at not just one course. This is going to be a whole series of courses you take. Some of it will be online, like the knowledge level, but then you must come to class, and we're going to train you how to answer the toughest type of questions in there. When you're done, you're an apologist. You'll be able to use it because you're going to have to demonstrate you can do this. So that's what we're thinking about next. We're not, we're, until we get the business plan in, in, in place, we're not going to really do any announcement much of it on that. We're just feasibility study right now. I've got two more group meetings to go. One in Kentucky and one in Denver. When we get done, we'll have a business plan, and then we'll see if we can do it, and then we'll announce it. That's what we're going to do there. 
So that's what we're doing, creation training. And if our job is based on 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, train others up so they can go out and teach also. We're outnumbered. Let's change that. So I'm going to open up. Um, yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Four graduates. And they're going to get up and say all kinds of nice things because I'm standing here and I'm bigger than they are. Yes, there's one. And he's a scientist and he could handle it. Well, thank you, Mike. Let's give Mike a hand for his presentation. Thank you. And we, we will take some questions now. And, uh, but while we're uh, doing that, I want to just remind you that we do support this ministry through free will offerings. So if you feel inclined to help to bring in speakers like Mike, uh, you'll feel f uh, free to contribute. So I'll ask Don and uh, Warren to come forward and just do that while you think about your questions. And uh, just to reiterate what Mike said about his uh, five-day course, yes, uh, uh, my wife and I were there last summer for their course, and Randy and Sheila, who will also be teaching tomorrow at the CEC class at Grace Academy, they've also gone through those five days of training. So if you want some experience with one day of training, which is a mini miniature version of that, you'll cover some topics, but certainly not all of them, then think about that. We can still take a few sign-ups. Uh, Randy and Sheila are in the back, and uh, go see them about that if you have an interest still. So let's, yeah, um, if you want to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, make it out to the Apologetics Forum, and those are tax deductible if you write a check and get credit for that at the end of the year. So questions that people may have. Okay, we'll start in the back. You had your hand up first. Yes, sir. I, I don't know how to quite ask this question, but I'm going to try. Have you noticed a cross parallel between the news media, the television, movies, and uh, the colleges, the, the message, the secular message that is getting across to everyone? That, do you think there's an interplay? Do you think it works together? And why? And who's behind it? Okay. Uh, I've noticed a cross um, similarity between what we hear in the news media, politicians, uh, even the colleges. Yes, they're very similar in what they teach. And the, who's behind it is Satan. Satan is behind it. Uh, so there is a conspiracy. It is a spiritual battle. We need to understand that. The whole thing we're in is a spiritual battle. It is not a scientific issue in here. What we see is the same thing. Same-sex marriage, abortion, evolutionism, moral relativism. Those four. Most everything we have, all these ideas, evil things, are coming out of two philosophies. Evolutionism and moral relativism, which are diametrically opposed to each other. Because evolution believes what? Real absolutes in science. Moral relativism says there are no absolutes. And people are out there living in contradictions. But this is what our students are being taught. But yes, there is a combination. All this is coming about. What that means is we have a big job to do. And we need to go out there and get started. Don't wait for the next person. We need to get ourselves trained. Parents, you need to make sure you get trained to protect your children and your grandchildren. Don't think that they're going to be OK. You're going to lose them. Where we lose a lot is the first week of college. Before they take their first class, we lose them called welcome week that welcome week they will either take a class they're told they have to go through this one class for a week or they have to belong to a group and what do they learn in those groups drop your religious beliefs and start thinking gay marriage is normal abortion is normal and that's what they train and our students cannot handle that unless they're equipped and our Christian schools need to up the ante and get there they need teachers trained who can do this I live right next door to a classical Christian school in Boise, Idaho. Found out they don't have a clue about creation evolution. Found out their students going to college. This is one of the top academic Christian schools in the country. There's a wait list to get in this. People move there to get in this school. But what, they're not, what they don't know is they're losing their children in colleges because they're not prepared. They're very important. Are there other questions? Yes, we had a yeah. No, you can sit. Uh, yeah, the, you at attention. 
You, you, were, you were mentioning deceive, and uh, I really believe that uh, our society, especially our Christian community, needs to understand that we've been deceived through the, really the Word of God and misinterpretation of the Word of God. Uh, I just totally believe that, uh, that we've been really deceived. Uh, let's just take the Antarctic Treaty, uh, 1961 to 1971. Uh, General Admiral Byrd, do you, you know anything about him? Go ahead. Okay. Well, he, uh, he discovered some uh, land there, okay? And uh, we can't go to that land because the government's 50 countries have not let us, any, any strangers go there at all, any, any people at all, okay, unless you're a scientist or a government, okay? Why is that? Why are we being deceived from NASA? The word NASA itself means deceive, okay? So why are we so, you know, we're deceived by, by you know, uh, education, but in the churches we're being deceived from even the word of God. And I don't understand why we can't come out and just stand up. You asked earlier, uh, who's, who's for flat earth? Well, I am. I've done some study on it. Why does anyone not want to stand up for flat earth? Have they done their research? Uh, why, and, in other words, a belief in a flat earth? Pardon me? A belief in a flat earth? Do I believe in the flat yes. earth? Yes, I do. Okay. Yes, I do. And, and the reason being is because there's over 145 scripture that backs it up. Okay. And I'm willing to be laughed at for the, for the cause of Christ. Okay. And I'd like to get together with you or, or anyone else that can disprove flat earth and prove that there is a globe earth because the globe earth there's no real pictures from NASA they're all CGI's okay they're all fake they're all they're they're all uh, 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 basically they're all pictures drawn pictures like you would show with the fossils okay, okay. let's go on to another question I'll answer that one later yeah back here because the Bible does say, uh, never says flat earth. You'll have to show me those scriptures without taking anything out of context. Okay, let's go to another question. Uh, carbon-14 in diamonds. I suppose to, I don't know, diamonds are supposed to be, what, millions of years old. No way carbon-14 could be in there. Why don't they, is there a, a substance, maybe quartz, that's not supposed to have any carbon-14 in, that they could set the standards at their laboratories and say, this is your background radiation? Okay, uh, diamonds they, have they, carbon-14. They, they have carbon-14, supposed to be millions of years old, so they say, well, it's background radiation. Okay. Okay, the, the interesting thing about diamonds is they're a very special kind of stone. We don't find carbon-14 in anything but basically organic material, like once living things. So why do we find it in diamonds? Well, diamonds are a very special kind of stone because they're made up of pure carbon. That's all a diamond is, is pure carbon. You get carbon deposits, so they have carbon-12, 13, and 14 in them. But after about 100,000 years, all the datable carbon-14 should be gone. So why is it still there? Uh, the diamonds are almost immune from contamination to hardest substance. Uh, what are they doing about this information? Ignoring it. It's pretty much what they're doing. Same thing for the dinosaurs. They're either ignoring the information that we're finding carbon-14, soft tissue, DNA, and proteins, and red blood cells in dinosaur bones, either ignoring it or just saying contamination, which we can rule out too. Uh, or, this is their big one, there's some unknown process prefer preserving dinosaur tissue or soft tissue for 65 million years. And that's what our students are learning, and they don't have to defend against that. So, as, as far as calibration, we understand pretty well about carbon-14, the decay rate. It has a half-life about 5,730 years, so we're pretty accurate on that. So there should be absolutely no carbon-14 left in diamonds. But if we're finding it in diamonds all over the world, then that can't contribute that to contamination because we're taking them to the evolutionist labs and finding this. If it was contamination in the dinosaur bones, that can't be. Because if it was due to contamination, we should find some bones that have very little carbon-14, some bones that have a lot of carbon-14. We're finding a consistent level in carbon-14 in dinosaurs all over the world, which rules out contamination. So we're a pretty strong case there. We win dinosaurs. We should win every area of science today. Question. I was wondering, <coughs> excuse me, uh, there's an interesting geological feature over in central Washington um, where two rhinoceroses were uh, 
is that, can you say rhinoceri? No, rhinoceros. Rhinos. Rhinos, there you go. <clears throat> were buried in about 200 feet of what they call lava. I was wondering if you've heard about that or investigated it yourself. I've heard about it. I have not investigated it personally. Love to show it to you. But um, two rhinos, rhinos were um, mother and baby were, they were entombed and you can even feel the skin yes. as the, uh, the cavities there, the bones were taken out by a, by a college. But it is interesting, and it would be neat to have a creation scientist look at that and try to interpret this because obviously the evolutionary model just doesn't, it's just too impossible to have the perfect skin and yes. buried down there. So it would be interesting to have I, I agree. It would be very interesting to see what they come up with. I've only heard about it, read about it, but um, I haven't done any study on it. I'm more interested in the dinosaurs because that's a killer. Why are we finding lots of soft tissue there? Another question. So if, if an evolutionist would use the same three critical questions yes. to a creationist. And that's a fair game, too, and they should. Yeah, what I'm saying, how do you know it's true, et cetera, et cetera. Then I love that, that question. So they say it to us, we say it to them. Then right. what do we do? Okay, uh, here's the typical question you might get. Why do you believe the Bible? Now, that type of question, why do you believe the Bible? Doesn't matter what religion they are. The question is, why do you believe the Bible? So don't talk about any other religion. You have a wonderful opportunity to evangelize now. You're going to tell them why you believe the Bible. And you can go through several things. Well, I can look at archaeology. or archaeology. Uh, it has a pretty good track record, doesn't it? The history. You have a good track record there. We have good history. How about prophecy? It's, got, it's about uh, over 20% prophecy in the Bible. It's pretty accurate there, too, 100%. Uh, we can look at science, scientific evidence. The Bible's not a science book, but it does talk a lot about science talks about the stars being too numerous to count. Well, that was way before we had all this modern astronomy. Guess what? They're too numerous to count. You could count a star every second for three billion years. You still wouldn't even be close. You wouldn't even be close. Manuscript evidence. Tremendous amount of manuscript evidence. So we have a lot. And we can even talk about the resurrection. There's a lot of overwhelming evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we have that. And then what we need to do is tell them, when we talk about the resurrection, tell them, this is why I believe. And you get right to the gospel. You need to get to the gospel presentation in this. Because that's what they're asking. Why do you believe the Bible? It's changed my life. And let me tell you how it changed it. John 3.16. John 3.16. It's kind of like a mini gospel. There. Most people know that. This is how I do the gospel. John 3.16. Well, what about John 3.17? What does it say? For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be Oh, good, 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 saved. If you don't understand that word saved, you don't understand the gospel. How do you, what does saved mean there? Well, we've got to go back to the book of Genesis. Saved from what? Why do we need to be saved? First three chapters of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He's the creator. That means he sets the rules and standards, right? That's why it's so important, that very first verse. That's why we call him Lord also. Okay, he created everything. How good was it? It was perfect, wasn't it? Thank you for asking this. It was a perfect creation. How do we know it was perfect? Genesis 131, he called it very good. Does that mean perfect? Absolutely. Because in Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, it says the works of God are perfect. And creation was the works of God. Then he gives one rule. Adam, you one rule. Don't eat the fruit of this tree. If you eat the fruit of this tree, you're going to die. What did Satan say? You, what did God say to him? If you eat the fruit of the tree, you will surely die. Well, let's be careful that. The translation there is not the best. You will surely die. The word for die and the word for surely are the same Hebrew word. Dying, you will die is the more correct translation there. Meaning, if you do this, you're going to eventually die. So the physical death process started there. The spiritual happened immediately. So Adam, he broke the rule. God kept his promise. He keeps his promises. We spiritually died, and the physical death process started. Then what does God do then? At that point, we are separated from a perfect and holy God, aren't we? What I'm telling you is this whole thing about saved. We're separated from perfect holy God. And you know what hope we have at that point in the gospel? None. We are absolutely without hope at that point in the gospel. 
This is why it's so important for churches to preach the whole gospel and not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're setting us up for failure. They have to give the bad news so we can fully appreciate the good news. So now we're without hope. So now we need to turn to the good news. And where does the good news start? Genesis 3.15. God gives the first promise of victory in a Savior. And he fulfills that. And guess where? John 3.16. See how it all comes around there? That's getting to the gospel. And then you can go on with the rest of it. That is not what we can do. It's not our works. There's only one way to get there. No other name under all of heaven other than Jesus Christ can we be saved. And it's only by his grace and the faith he gave us that we can be saved. It's not what we can do ourselves. He says, we need to have real true repentance there. Godly sorrow can lead to salvation. Not salvation, but lead to salvation. He tells us that. So we do need to have that repentance. You know what also says? You don't have an excuse. No one has an excuse for not believing the greater. No one. John, Romans 1, 19, 20. Then he finishes, I finished the gospel, Romans 10, 9. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Think about that, Seth. Confess what? Confess means you're making a promise. Promise what? Jesus is going to be Lord of your life. That means heart, soul, and mind. Giving everything to him. And then you'll be saved. Saved from what? Eternal punishment. That is the gospel we need to be preaching in our churches. But many pastors don't believe the full gospel because they bought into this evolution thinking and bringing it into the church. Some are afraid to teach it because they have different ideas in the church. And we have our professors in our Christian universities teaching billions of years, which distort the whole foundation of the gospel. Notice, before we start talking the world, we need to clean up our own act, don't we? How can we tell people to believe God's word when we don't believe it ourselves? You had a pretty good point. Thank you for that. You, get, you don't have to do any push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> See, you push the right button on Mike, and you get the whole gospel... I love to give the gospel. It's my favorite thing to do. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you. By the way, it tells us to study, to show yourself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Second Timothy 2.15. Yes, sir. And if you read Genesis, memorize First Genesis. It puts everything in the right sequence for creation, for creation of man. It is factual. That's a fact we can stand on. Yes. Now, you look at these facts, take that geological column. You cannot find that anywhere in the world. They date by what they have said, this means this, this means this, this means this. We find it, and there you go. They make a lot of assumptions. The circular reasoning is what they use. They use the fossils to date yeah. the layers, and the layers to date the fossil. <laughs> And they get away with that. Amen. And there's one other thing. There's about 104 ways to date fossils. 99 of those show a young age. That's right. Five show an old age. What do you think they use? Hey, let me tell you. Our word is true. God is true. And if we don't stand up and speak up, you're a wimp. We are Christians, and God stands behind us. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much. Heinz, Thank you. If nobody has a question, we're either done or I'll ask questions, and then you're in real trouble. <laughs> well, let, let, let's take one more question, okay, one more and question. then we'll uh, break. Is this about my grandchildren? No, I wish oh, I <laughs> no, if, uh, I'm not understanding where you were saying as far as carbon dating being 80,000 or 100,000. Uh, so are you saying that the Bible is not, you know, showing the earth is 6,000 years yeah. old, but rather No, no, that, okay, good question. And I'm not saying the earth is old. How they do the dating in carbon-14, um, the, the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. In other words, every 5,730 years, half the carbon has decayed back into nitrogen. But it's also being created in the upper atmosphere by bombardment of cosmic rays. What we do is take a sample population of carbon-14 atoms, See how long it takes some of it to decay, because we never know when an atom's going to decay. We just don't know that. So we take a population, see how long it takes some of it to decay. We run that experiment over and over and over again, and we get a consistent answer. Then we extrapolate that back, how long would it take half of it, and how long would it take all of it. So there's an extrapolation in all these dating methods. And we believe for carbon-14, we're pretty close on that. Some of them, we have an extrapolation of billions of years. That's eh, a little bit wishy-washy, but... Carbon-14, I'll buy into that one. So it's not that the Earth is at all, because the 
Bible does teach about a 6,000 year old earth. Where do we get that from? Genesis chapter 5, the genealogies. You line those names up, we see Adam was living at the same time as Noah's father, and Noah was living at the same time as Abraham's father. The ages overlap. So we know the time from today back to Jesus about 2,000 years. Jesus back to Abraham about 2,000 years. We have enough written records for that. The only time in question is Adam to Abraham. Adam to uh, Abraham, and you go through those genealogies, that gives about 2,000 years. Let's do our math. 2,000 plus 2,000 plus 2,000 is about what? Pretty easy, isn't it? Oh, but wait a minute, Mike. Wait a minute. I'm going to cover all the bases here. You forgot something very important. I'm doing the same things they'll, they'll do, because I grew up an evolutionist. Couldn't there have been millions of years of time before Adam? No. Jesus took care of that, because he believed in young earth. In Mark 10, verse 6, Jesus makes this statement. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. What did Jesus just tell us? Man and woman were on the planet from the beginning of the creation, not after millions of years. We've got an airtight case, don't we? So why don't all the pastors believe this? They've been secularized. Okay, let's uh, thank Mike for that presentation and the Q&A. And Mike will be available at the back table afterwards. If you want to talk to some more and ask him some more questions, feel free to do that. I'm going to bring up the last slide here. And just to remind you that uh, next month we have uh, J.D. Mitchell, who is a, uh, a geologist, an engineer, and uh, he speaks and has written books on creation versus evolution. Uh, so he'll be here next uh, uh, June the 3rd, Friday, June the 3rd, and he'll talk about what's happening in the church. You know, how do we reverse the secularization of the church that we see happening? What do we have to do to make that happen? And in his credentials, he's uh, been doing this for quite a few years, speaking on these kinds of topics. So you'll want to uh, hear him speak. Just to remind you, on the back table, we have a whole bunch of brochures which tell you more information about the apologetics form. If you want you pick up some of these brochures on the back and feel free to bring them uh, back to your church and uh, let them know what we do here. Um, r remind you that um, the, there are three groups having book tables there. The Apologetics Forum itself. CAPS is another book and mostly DVD table there. And, uh, and then Mike has uh, some books and DVDs at his table as well, as, long as, as well as some more information. Uh, we have a, a CD we give out on our table, the Apologetics Forum table. It's called the Fallout um, Criteria, that we, or the Fallout Problem that we have. It was put together by CMI, and it answers the question, why do our youth leave the church? What, what's missing? And so it's a short video, 25 minutes, and uh, it's free. But if you pick one up, you get a promise to pass it on to somebody else after you've listened to it. And that's why we make it uh, for free. Um, so pick up brochures, uh, uh, trifolds, etc. on that. Um, some of you uh, may have heard about the, the movie, Is Genesis History? That was shown in the theaters here a few months back. It is now available on a DVD. Uh, we have copies of that. Uh, we just... Uh, we had 15 for the last meeting, and they're all sold out, but we've got 10 more. So if you missed out and you still want to get that DVD, uh, go to the apologetics table and you can uh, uh, get that. The other thing that I want to make you aware of, uh, you, I think most people get this magazine at home. It's called the Hometown Values Savings Magazine, HBSM. And it comes out, I think, once a month or so. And there are ads in there, coupons. Well, we got ourselves listed in here now, too. So if you want to know more about the apologetic form, you can you know, refer to that uh, as well. Um, Starfetti, he was uh, here a few months ago uh, speaking, and uh, he's written quite a few books under the auspices of uh, Creation Ministries International. And uh, we now have some more books from him, including the Genesis account, which is a very detailed um, commentary on the first 11 chapters of Genesis, including a scientific, the modern scientific issues are addressed there. So with that, uh, we're going to take a break.
there's refreshments there. And, and of course, make uh, um, a look at the resource tables. And if you do have an